Hi there, welcome to lecture three. In this video, we are going to talk about tools for computing Bayes factors, both conceptually as well as getting into some software, specifically JASP, and looking at how to compute Bayes factors for these binomial models that we've been considering for the past two lectures. So hopefully you've watched lecture two, uh, otherwise the things that we're gonna talk about today won't make too much sense. Recall from lecture two that Bayes' theorem gives us the following equation. Now this equation looks a bit daunting, but basically all it says is that after you observe some data, the posterior odds in favor of one model over the other, here I have it cast as the null H0 over H1, those posterior odds can be found by taking the prior odds, that is the probability of each model before observing data, and multiplying by this updating factor. And that updating factor is what we call the Bayes factor. And so what this gives us is two different, what I would call conceptual definitions of the Bayes factor. The first comes from the actual form of the Bayes factor itself, right? This is just a ratio, and it's the factor by which the observed data is more likely under one model compared to the other. Now the other definition, the one that comes from this identity, is giving you the definition of a base factor as an updating factor. That is, it's the factor by which the prior odds between models is updated after observing data. Now this is pretty powerful because you're going to learn very quickly in this video that base factors, while generally hard to compute, are easy to compute with the right software. And so you need to know what to do with those numbers. And this, is, this gives you two ways that you can interpret these Bayes factors. Okay. Oops, what am I doing here? Delete that. So when we're talking about these Bayes factors, we're, we're, we're using this notion of odds, right? It's the, uh, it's the factor by which the prior odds is updated after observing data. So basically we're giving posterior odds for one model over another. And so people often have a really good question, especially if they haven't done a lot with probability theory before, and that is this notion of what are odds anyway? Uh, what's the difference between odds and probability? So I wanna take a little aside and investigate the differences between these two concepts. They're extremely related, but they're slightly different. So let's explore that. So first of all, odds is nothing more than a ratio of probabilities. So when we say something has, say, one-to-one -one odds, what we're saying is that the probability of one compared to or divided by the probability of the other is equal to one, okay? As a fraction, they are equal to each other. And we say that these two models are equally likely in this context. So for example, if, if you assumed that you had prior odds of one-to-one, -one, you would be saying that before observing any data, that one model is just as likely as the other. So that's what we mean by prior odds of one to one. On the other hand, if you had prior odds of three to one in favor of the null, like you really didn't believe the null, then you might say that the, that the probability of the null hypothesis is three times bigger than the probability of the alternative hypothesis, again, before observing data. So in this case, this fraction P of H0 over P of H1 would be equal to three. And again, that just means that before observing any data, H0 is three times more likely than H1. So let's look at an example of how this Bayes factor identity, this notion of posterior odds coming from prior odds times Bayes factor actually works in this case to give us posterior probability. So let's do a little bit of math, okay? So let's suppose that we uh, start with prior odds of one to one. This is something that could differ between people, but this is a good default place to start. And then let's assume that the observed data gives us a Bayes factor in favor of the null, so BF01, of four, okay? Well then by the equation that we stated above, the posterior odds are equal to the prior odds times the Bayes factor. So the prior odds were one, the Bayes factor was four, so simply multiplying those two gives us posterior odds equal to four. So that is after observing data, H0 is now four times as likely as H1, okay? So the question that you might have is how do we get from these posterior odds to an actual posterior probability? We've stated over and over that one of the limitations of classical statistical inference is that it does not 
give us the probability that the model is correct after observing data, this posterior probability. So how can we get from this thing that we have, posterior odds, to that uh, vaunted quality that we would like to see? Well, let's again, let's do a little bit of algebra. So by above, we know that the posterior odds for H0 over H1 is equal to 4. Okay, so let's set that up in an equation, right? That, again, by definition means that the probability of H0 given the data divided by the probability of H1 given the data, these posteriors, that ratio is equal to 4. Now, one of the things that is implicit here is that H0 and H1 are the only models under consideration, okay? The way we've stated these models, you know, in the, in the binomial test, H0 is usually that the, the binomial parameter W is equal to 0.5, and H1 is that it's not equal to 0.5. So those two models partition the space, so to speak. They, they comprise all possibilities of truth. So if it is the case, and it is usually in the cases that we're considering, that H0 and H1 are the only two models under consideration, then we know that their posterior probabilities must add to one, right? Anything that forms the whole sample space in a probability sense, those probabilities all have to add to one. So what that gives us is an equation. It tells us that the posterior probability of H0 plus the posterior probability of H1 is equal to 1. Now, why would I want to use this? Well, remember, the winning model was H0, right? Posterior odds was 4 to 1 over H1, so I would like to know this quantity. But this one here, it gets in the way. But if I could solve this equation for the posterior probability of H1, then I could sub it in here and get everything in terms of this one, which is what I'm looking for. I'm using a little algebra trick here. So let's do that. Let's recast this equation that we just got in terms of H1. So the posterior probability of H1 is equal to 1 minus the probability posterior probability of H0. Now let's sub that in to equation star. Let's see what that looks like. Okay. So now, instead of having an equation like we had above, right, this one, we're now going to have one that looks a little bit more complicated. But the key here is that the only unknown, so to speak, is this posterior probability. So let's do a little bit more algebra and see if we can get it by itself. So the first thing I'm going to do is multiply this uh, up here. Okay, So this is going to be four times that. Use the distributive property, and it's going to give me that the posterior probability of H0 is equal to 4 times 1 minus 4 times that posterior probability. Now let's move all the posterior probabilities over onto one side. So I'm going to choose the left side. So that means I'm going to add this part over to here. So this is just rearranging the equation. Now I'm close. I'm almost there. I want to solve for this. So let's notice that it's common to both terms. Let's factor it out. And then what I'm left with is 1 plus 4. So this gives me a little simpler equation. It tells me the posterior probability times 1 plus 4 equals 4. Well, now all I've got to do is divide. If I want to solve for the posterior probability, I divide by 1 plus 4, and I get 4 divided by 5, or 80%. So this tells us that this posterior probability is 80%. And here's one of the nice things. If you don't like doing that algebra every time, this procedure above, if you, if you watch it a few times, you might get the hang of it. You can actually use it to prove something very general, and that is the posterior probability is always equal to the posterior odds divided by 1 plus the posterior odds. And in practice, that's actually an equation that I use all the time. I don't actually go through and do all of this algebra every time. Uh, I've done it enough times to know that all I've got to do is just take that posterior odds and divide it by 1 plus. So we'll use this a lot in this course this semester. So that's an aside. That's how you get from posterior odds to posterior probabilities. We'll come back and see that more, but our main goal today is to compute some Bayes factors. So how do we do that? Well, you know what the Bayes factor looks like, right? It's the probability of the data given one model over the probability of the data given the other model. So that means we need to be able to compute these guys. These are called marginal probability, or yeah, marginal probabilities or marginal likelihoods, sorry. Um, and so we need to do this for both models, for H0 and H1. How do we do that? Well, in general, this is hard. Now, we did have one method that we introduced in the last lecture, in lecture two, and that was called the 
predictive distribution. So that method was based on a paper of Alex Etz and, and colleagues that I uh, linked in the last video. And it was actually quite a nice method, okay? Right, the idea was that we compute these predictive distributions for both models. And what these do is they show the data that we would expect for each model weighted by the prior probabilities for all values of the parameter. So if we have a prior on the parameter, like a uniform prior, or one of those smooth peaked priors or something even different, we then can uh, weight the data that we would expect by that prior. And what that does is if you have data that's not very likely a priori, then it's not gonna get much of a push uh, a posteriori, that is after seeing the data. And so it's called regularization, if you will. But here's what it looked like in practice. Okay, this is all just from the last lecture. So example one was our uniform prior. And so what we do is we plot the possible data that we would expect under each model. Now under H0, remember H0 is the model that W is 0.5, right? That they're guessing on each trial. And so the data we would expect is this exact binomial distribution, right? The most likely data are, you know, half of the trials, which is 10 out of 20 in this case. Now under the alternative, Right? The idea is that W, that, that binomial parameter, is equally likely across all of the spectrum of possible values for W. And so what that means then is that any possible number of wins is also equally likely. And so that's why we get this uniform distribution for our predictive distribution. And then the base factor is simply take your observed data. Remember the observed data were, was nine successes out of 20 trials. So you take that observed data and you simply find the ratio of the probabilities of that data under each model. So it was more likely under H0, right? It was this likelihood, 0.1602. We divide that by 0.0476 and we get a base factor of 3.36. That literally means that the, the data are 3.36 times more likely under H0 than H1, okay? And then we did the same thing for the smooth peaked prior. I'm not gonna walk all the way through that again. I will note uh, that this smooth peaked prior that I call it actually has a name. It's called a beta 2-2 distribution. You can Google that. Uh, there's a lot of mathematics involved in the beta distribution, but it does make a nice prior for these binomials. And you'll see it in JASP here in a few minutes. Now with, with this prior, we get a slightly different base factor, but again, the, the main conclusion holds, and that is the observed data are some positive amount times more likely under H0 than H1. Now there's some downsides to this approach. One is that can, it, it can be computationally difficult. It's not too bad in this case. In fact, the R code for doing it is, is available in the lecture two videos uh, link. There's a link in the description. Uh, it's not, you know, if you, if you have some calculus background, it's not too bad. If you don't have calculus background, it might be quite difficult. And the other thing is the plot contains no obvious information about the parameter W. So while it gives us the relative likelihood of the data under the models, right, it helps us with the model comparison problem, it doesn't help us with estimating the parameter value. So we're missing the posterior distribution. So it would be really nice if we could get some kind of conceptual visual output that not only gave us the base factor, right, the, the thing that does the model comparison, but once we know one model over the other, it would also give us, um, you know, some estimation, that is the posterior distribution. Well, it turns out that this is entirely possible, and it's sort of cool how it works. So here's, here's what we do. We start by plotting the prior and the posterior on the same plot. Now, from work that we've done before, uh, remember the posterior distribution comes from Bayes' theorem, right? And so you get, uh, you, you observe in this case nine successes, and so now we get a posterior distribution that's peaked down here around 45% or so, and then it levels off both ways. It looks kind of like a normal distribution. It's not, it's actually called a beta distribution but it kind of has that characteristic shape. After seeing data, our uncertainty now goes from all the way across equally likely to now, eh, you know, we're in this range between, you know, 0.2 and 0.6-ish. So if we plot both the prior and the posterior, here's one cool thing you can do. You can find the Y value for a specific parameter value. That is this one right here at W equals 0 0.5. You can find that Y value on both the prior and on the posterior. 
Okay, now why do we do this? Well, here's the thing, okay? What do we notice? First of all, you'll notice that your belief in H0, right? H0 is the, is the model that assumes that W equals 0.5, right? Our belief that W equals 0.5 is captured by these two points. This is our belief prior to observing the data, and this is our belief after observing data. And what you'll notice is that that belief has increased, okay? From prior to posterior, we are now more confident that W equals 0.5. That means that we're more confident that H0 is the correct model, okay? That's kind of cool. So you might ask, by how much? How much does it increase? Well, it turns out in R, it's reasonably easy to compute them both. Now, I don't need you to necessarily be able to do this. This is just conceptual right now, but I went and took the liberty of doing this. I computed the posterior height and the prior height, and they turned out to be 3.364 and 1. Let me show you what that is on the graph up here. Okay, This height right here is equal to 1. This height is equal to 3.364. And you can kind of see that by the scale on the graph. Okay, And so the question is, by how much, by what factor does our belief that H... Uh, that W equals 0.5 increase, well, it goes from 1 to 3.36. That's a factor of 3.364, which, if you'll recall, is exactly the Bayes factor that we just got under the uniform prior. Let's double check that. I'm going to scroll back to here, and yes, exactly, 3.36 is the Bayes factor for the uniform prior. Hmm. Let's try the same thing with the smooth peak prior. So for the smooth peak prior, again, I told you earlier, this is a beta 2-2 distribution. Again, start by plotting the prior and the posterior on the same plot. So again, here's our prior, it's that smooth peaked one, and here's our posterior. Looks very similar, but as we know from lecture two, it is slightly different. Again, plot the Y value on these plots of your parameter at the null, so uh, W equals 0.5. So here it is on the prior, and here it is on the posterior. Okay. Sorry. And then again, what do we notice? Well, just like before, we noticed that our belief in H0, that is that W equals 0.5, has increased from prior to posterior. After observing data, we are more confident that the parameter is 0.5. So once again, we ask, by how much does this happen? Well, again, in R, we can compute them both. It turns out that the posterior uh, Y value is 3.546, and the prior Y value is 1.5. Okay, You can see that on the plot up here. This here is right in between 1 and 2, so that's about 1.5. This one's right in between uh, 3 and 4, so about 3.5-ish. If we take that ratio, that gives us the factor of increase. That turns out to be 2.364. Once again, this is the base factor that we obtained. So that's really cool. This idea that you can not only see the prior and the posterior distribution for your, for your model and your observed data uh, and, and your inference under that model, but you can also capture the Bayes factor simply by quantifying this amount of increase or decrease if it turns out to be less likely. So why is this important? Well, first of all, this is a cool fact. It always holds. This pattern always holds for the types of model comparisons that we will usually be doing in the behavioral sciences. Now, you always have to, you have to be very careful with that word always because some model comparisons, it doesn't work. It, it works under what are called nested model comparisons or, or point null model comparisons. And so you have to be real careful. But in general, for the types of stuff that we'll do in here, we'll be able to use this representation. It has a fun name. It's called the savage Dickey Density Ratio. And if you would like to read up more about this, uh, this was really popularized in our field by E.J. Wagenmachers in 2010. So this paper uh, in 2010 here in Cognitive Psychology, it's, uh, it's a really good paper and you'll learn a lot by reading it. And I also wrote a little bit on, uh, on a paper uh, generalizing the savage Dickey density ratio to some other things, and I'll show you how to use a particular software package called Greta to do some, uh, 
you know, computation on your own under the hood, if you will. But there's a link to, or at least a, a picture of that paper, and I'll put links down in the description. So again, those are just for your interest. So why does this all matter? Well, the reason it matters beyond being a good thing conceptually, because not only does it give you the model comparison via the base factor, but also gives you the posterior distribution, it's also one of the primary visualization methods that are used in JASP. And so I want to end today by demoing how to do this kind of work in JASP. So let's open up JASP. There it is. And that's what it looks like when you open it up. Now, we already have some data, right? Let's, let's, let's recall that uh, for the past couple of lectures, we've had this working example where we've got 20 trials and we had nine successes. So we want to know what's the base factor for the, you know, what's the winning model, what's the base factor, what's the posterior, all that good stuff. Let's do some Bayesian inference. So since we have that data already, we actually, um, let me just tell you something about JASP if you don't know. JASP requires you to load some data in before it'll give you any possibility of doing anything. We don't have a data set to work with, but what we do have are the summary statistics. So we can kind of short circuit this by adding what's called the summary statistics module. So you go up here and click this plus sign and check the summary statistics module. You'll notice it comes up now. So I'm going to click that button. And one of the options down here under frequencies is the Bayesian binomial test. So I'm going to click on that. This is going to give me some things to look at. Let me blow this up just a little bit for the video. Okay. Don't worry, I'll, I'll uh, move all this stuff over where you can see it in a second. So first of all, the Bayesian binomial test works by asking you how many successes did you have and how many failures did you have? And then what's the test value? But test value means what's the value of the parameter under the null hypothesis. So the successes, this was nine out of 20. So we're going to say nine successes. And for failures, uh, if it was nine successes, that leaves 11 failures. And then for the test value, we're going to leave that at 0.5. Now, the first thing that we'll notice, if we just go ahead and click here, is it immediately tells us the Bayes factor and the p-value with the test. Now, this Bayes factor may look a little bit funny because it's, uh, it's less than 1. It says BF10 is 0.297. Now, we know that the Bayes factor is supposed to be some number that represents how much more likely it is the data is under one model than the other. Well, that's, that's what this is doing. The problem is the data are more likely under the null, and this Bayes factor is casting it in terms of support for the alternative. So what we can do to make this look a little bit better for interpretation's sake is change our Bayes factor that's being reported from BF10 to BF01. And so if we do that and then go back over here, you'll see that the Bayes factor we got is exactly the same one that we've gotten multiple times throughout our lectures. It's 3.364. Now that's the Bayes factor, right? So we can write that up. We can say the data are 3.36 times more likely under the uh, null hypothesis than they are the alternative. But we might want to see the posterior distribution. And we can get that by clicking on this prior and posterior option under plots. And so what it will do is it will make exactly that diagram that I had earlier on the lecture notes. It'll have that plus it'll have some other stuff on it, which is really cool. It has the base factors both cast in terms of support for the alternative as well as support for the null. You'll notice that these are reciprocals of each other. That is, if you take the Bayes factor 3.364, you do 1 divided by that, you'll get exactly 0.297. Let's actually check that. 1 divided by 3.364 is 0.297. Oops, let me bring this back. Um, you'll get lots of other stuff, too. You'll get the median of the posterior distribution as well as this 95% credible interval. Again, these are things that we did in Lecture 2. JASP gives them to us just like that. In fact, there is the credible interval right there. So what this is, is this tells you that 95% of the posterior mass is between this point and this point. So it's all under here, right? We can see that intuitively, but this tells you uh, exactly where it is. Here's that savage dicky density ratio. So the belief in the null, that is that, that W equals 0.5, uh, increases from here before seeing data to here after seeing data. That's a factor of 3.36 as we checked earlier. And then finally, this little plot up here, this is what uh, EJ likes to call a pizza plot. It is an odds ratio representation 
of the base factor. So this white area of the pizza is support for the null and it's 3.36 times the red area which is support for the alternative. So that kind of gives you a visual representation of how much more likely the data are under one model than another. The only difference in the output in JASP between uh, what we've done and this output is in JASP, the population proportion is called theta as opposed to W, and that's a common choice for this as well. But it's, it's the same idea, right? It's just some, some books and some people like to use theta for that parameter. I like to use W, not sure why, uh, but it doesn't matter. The point is it's a proportion. It is a probability of success on each trial. And so um, that's what we get. One of the nice things about JASP is once you make this plot, you can actually click on this little triangle beside the plot name and you can save the image, uh, which is really neat because you can put that into a paper or a homework assignment. You can actually do some rudimentary editing of the image. Um, this one's a little hard to edit because it has a lot of stuff there, so it'll tell you that. But some of the plots, you can change the axes and things like that. So JASP is uh, getting to be really cool with respect to this. So that's, that's it for today. Let me quickly recap. First of all, today's goal was to get some tools for computing Bayes factors. And as you can see, we're moving toward using JASP for this. In fact, in the next lecture on, we will begin looking at specific types of research designs and look at how to do Bayesian inference in those using JASP. So we'll, we'll work through these things you can't see right now from t-tests to ANOVAs and regressions. We'll work through that the rest of the semester. But each time we're going to have the same idea that a Bayes factor is the likelihood of the data under one model compared to the other. And it's also the factor by which the prior odds are updated into posterior odds. And one of the bonuses in this video is you learned a way to convert from posterior odds to posterior probability. So I hope you find that useful and I will look forward to uh, visiting with you in lecture four where we start looking at Bayesian correlations and what all's involved there. So looking forward to it. I will see you next time.